Bill Schneider has 17 years experience working in the government black projects. He carried a level three security clearance. He's a former government geologist and engineer in the black projects, underground bases at areas 51, S4, and Los Alamos. He's gonna expand your mind here this morning. Please welcome Mr. Phil Schneider. Welcome to the show, everyone. We're doing uh, Conspiracy Corner with uh, Duke. Duke, how are you tonight? I'm doing great. Thanks for doing this again, Wes. Enjoy doing it. Thanks, man. No, I enjoy uh, talking with you. And I know one of the things we wanted, you and I were talking the other night, I said we should do a show on uh, Phil Snyder. And do you want to give the audience a background on Phil Snyder, who he was, and yeah, uh, just kind of an overview? Kind of an interesting background on uh, on Phil. He actually worked for the government for a number of years. Um, he was a, a geologist, had a background in uh, uh, machinist and, uh, and whatnot. And uh, he, according to his own uh, story, ended up working with them building deep underground military bases that uh, they were supposedly building at the rate of two or three a year. Um, and he claimed that at the time that he was going around making this data public, that they already had 131 of these deep underground military bases just inside the U.S., and they were all connected by tube ways. And he also talked about the kind of machinery that they were using to build these things and that they actually had a... Uh, uh, the, the usual boring machine is just a, a big like tube-shaped piece of machine that's got a boring bit on the front of it, uh, the same size as the tunnel they want to make, and it, it drills out through the rock or whatever, it bores its way through, and then the uh, the debris is um, uh, uh, goes through a series of conveyor belts out through the back of the machinery. The newer one that they were using when he was still working on it, and this was quite a while ago, back in the, the 70s, apparently they had a nuclear-powered version of it, that had a tip on it rather than a, a bit, and the tip would heat up to about 1,500 degrees, and it would basically melt or deflagrate through the uh, rock, and then the machine pushing through it would push the uh, slag into, like, cracks in the rock and sort of form um, a casement uh, right of the vitrified rock right around the machine itself as it continued to crawl forward, so you didn't have to... Uh, put any kind of truss work or anything to hold the tunnel up. It was basically held up by the, uh, the melted rock that the machine displaced as it was crawling through it. And um, Phil ended up getting away from this whole situation because he was working, uh, according to him again, for uh, NATO, building all of these things. And he found out, um, he got a couple of uh, invites to go to secret UN meetings that were being held and uh, they weren't at the United Nations uh, headquarters, but at some other location. And he claimed that they had a series of chairs that were set up on a higher level. And after all of the normal people were in the room, that uh, out came marching the people that were going to set up these chairs at the higher level, and that they were like seven-foot-tall gray aliens, um, <clears throat> which is where the whole whole story kind of takes a real hard left turn and gets really kind of strange. But uh, he went around between 1995 and 96 and did like 30 different uh, public uh, meetings on this where he was one of the speakers or the only speaker and talked about this whole situation. It was his contention that uh, the governments of the world have a, um, a working relationship with these aliens and that they're working toward a, long, a long-term goal of establishing one world order and that the aliens want to be the ones pulling the strings. And uh, reputedly or reportedly, this is why he was uh, eventually assassinated after he claimed that they tried to kill him 13 times um, before it looks like they finally got him because the whole thing on his death is just so weird and contradictory. It just doesn't make any sense. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, he was just one of these guys that supposedly did all of this sort of... Uh, black ops work for the government and then decided that what they were doing was completely out of line. He was working for the bad guys and uh, and decided that he would try and make amends for it by actually getting some of this information out. I'm Phil Schneider. Uh, I spent 17 years in black budget programs. Um, government geologist, as engineer, structural engineer with aerospace applications. 
uh, self-taught metallurgist, became uh, uh, kind of famous in my own right. Um, I basically uh, would have a set of notes here, but they're unavailable <laughs> in all this melee. Up here I have different artifacts uh, explaining uh, some of them are alien metals that have been produced both on this planet and the confines of outer space that are now used in all stealth aircraft. It's all stealth aircraft, for instance, all black jets, uh, what you're seeing of, of black helicopters and the like, uh, the skins and the coatings and the residues that are used predominantly in the, in the aircraft themselves, in the airframes and the, in the rotor blades and the fans and in some cases in submarines, uh, special titanium hulls, in the Phoenix class submarines now. Uh, all these come from, all this has come from alien technology. 1947 is what the public has been told. Uh, something crashed in the backyard in New Mexico, a place called Roswell, New Mexico. Unfortunately, that's what the public's been told. The military's known about the alien question for the better part of 70 years, and they first saw their glimpse of what was going on as early as 1909 in the American Southwest. Now, Army cavalry evidently were chasing some bandits, and they entered this cave. They were holed up in a cave, and what they found in there was flying discs and, and little gray guys and all kinds of weird things, and they didn't know how to explain that, and they wrote them down as best they could, and it's been in secret archives ever since. This up in the, this in the, down by the Truth or Consequences uh, area of New Mexico. Well, the alien thing is more than just a what I'd call a non-visible threat. We on the surface, first of all, all information dealing with alien or alien reproduced technology or alien reproduced vehicles or any other kinds of things, well hidden from the American public. Our black budget, for instance, garners $1.023 trillion every two years. It's over $500 billion a year. Right now, there are 131 active deep underground military bases in the United States. There's 1,477 of them worldwide. Each one has an average cost of 17 to 19 billion dollars. Each one is uh, built in the site. Uh, oh, it used to be it'd take a year to two years to build each one, and now they're capable of building a couple of them a year uh, with sophisticated methods. Now, uh, my colleague uh, Al Bielik has actually been on some of the high-speed railways, uh, the magneto-leviton trains that connect all the deep underground military bases within the United States. He's been on a Mach 2 train and floats off of, floats off of a single rail at a, a three quarters of an inch off the rail and is uh, what you'd call high tech. We have nothing like this on the surface. Uh, the public basically has been totally lied to. We're considered stupid or even moronic in some cases. Uh, it's got to stop. If, if we're going to gain our country back, we must, and I repeat, must, regain, we must instill in our public officials, anybody that goes and does public service, they must tell us the truth. If they cannot do this, then, then they must be impeached or they must, must be removed from office. If this cannot occur, if, if the truth cannot totally come out, the, the, I, there are reasons for secrecy, for instance, but if the truth cannot totally come out, uh, what's the use in us having anything called freedom? Okay, now I have pictures here that I'm going to show you during the break in artifacts. And I ask you to kind of look at them but not handle them. I have actual crashed retriever metal from Roswell, New Mexico. It's given to me when I was 14 years old. For instance, I've got other things. I've got Pieces, pieces of titanium. This piece of titanium, a special titanium alloy, made for everything from the original SR-71 Blackberry. That's old hat now. Uh, F-117As, their old hat now. Uh, they're making a whole new class of 
hypersonic above Mach 5 aircraft that employ they employ extremely modern charged particle beam weapons. They don't even use lasers anymore. Uh, computer enhanced imaging radar, although it's used in helicopters for public surveillance, computer enhanced imaging radar, and in satellite technology. Uh, the brand new kit on the block is a is a kind of infrared technology uh, where a, a satellite a 150,000 miles out in a geosynchronous orbit, or not quite geosynchronous orbit, but but these spy satellites can literally look in and see a dime on the floor, say on your kitchen floor. They have a resolution factor of 99.999961. Uh, this particular piece of metal, I'm going to drop it on the floor here, it'll kind of ring like a bell. You can't break it. Withstand temperatures in excess of 7,500 degrees Fahrenheit, it has niobium in it. It also has miranite in it, element 123. Yeah, please do. Uh, it's in a, it's in a non-crystalline form. This is just kind of a dripping off of the, out of the main crucible. Here's a crystalline example. It's in the scalenohedral crystalline form. We got this from the large grays uh, technology. Uh, this is grown in the confines of, of outer space, which has not quite a super vacuum, but uh, by the way, this is capable of withstanding temperatures in excess of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's great for uh, certain parts of aircraft. Uh, this kind of material I work with on a daily basis. Up here we have a transparency of Groom Lake. Groom Lake is where the infamous Area 51, S4, S2, the CIA base, uh, uh, it was originally a bombing range, a nuclear test site. Uh, it was later become the most secret base in the United States. Um, it employs over 18,000 workers who work in shifts of 12 hours a, at a whack. Most of them work in the cover of darkness, like us. We built out nine underground military bases there, each with an average uh, uh, capacity, capable of basically a city underground, roughly four and a quarter cubic miles hollowed out underground. They have boring machines, for instance. They have boring machines, for instance. They don't bore. They literally vitrify and melt the rock, deflagrate the rock. It's a very sophisticated laser. Uh, uh, melting and deflagrating system. It reduces the rock to a powder and then melts the, the remaining rock as a coating on the inside of the base so you don't have to use gunite cements and other kinds of things like that. That's all, the, all old hat now. Uh, technology is so just basically, the new technology we get is the old hat of the military. I'm going to be real brief about it. I carried a level one security clearance, the Rylite 38 factor. There are very few of us there's nobody except myself, to my knowledge, talking like this. <clears throat> nobody. I'm breaking the law. I'm breaking world as well as federal law. I'm coming out and even talking about this to a group of people. I love my country more than I love my life. Two weeks ago, I was shot in the shoulder. I don't want to gore you women out, but I was shot in the shoulder up here. I recently have become friends of a of a uh, retired FBI agent who took me under the wing. He says, I've never seen a person braver than you. And I said, well, there's more coming. Our patriot movement in these United States is going to pick up the ball, and we are going to kick the parasites out. He has a very out. impeccable military record. Mm -hmm. And when you hear him speak, and I'll, and I'll play clips of him, throughout the our show here but when you hear him speak he's very no nonsense on on what he's telling you and the part that bothers me about the Phil Snyder thing is i've heard that from several people in fact i had one military insider he he called them the dracos and i said what is the dracos and he said the dracos is a reptilian alien uh and and they keep 
pointing towards this Dulce. I know you and I talked about it on the last show, yeah. this Dulce New Mexico. And I've been told several times to go check out Dulce New Mexico. There's more than just um, alien stuff going on. When the locals tell you they saw a half man, half something running around out there, maybe stop and listen to what they have to say. And this is people in the military telling me this. Uh, maybe stop and listen to what they have to say because they're probably not lying to you. Um, Phil had an interesting, and I'll play the clip here in a moment, but he, the whole story of him getting attacked, uh, do you want to go into that, how he actually lost his fingers and was opened up like a fish? Yeah, um, actually, prequel to that, he was in more than one firefight with these things. Previous to that whole situation, he had apparently been lowered down into another same site of, sort of situation where they were drilling a, a hole straight down that they were then going to use to make uh, connecting cross tunnels on and uh, and either bore or blast the uh, the material in between that they wanted to get out of there out. And they had bored into uh, a cave. And so, of course, they knew that the, the bore bed had got into some opening, so they took him in the basket. And apparently these, these uh, bores were about six feet across, so it's big enough to put a human in a basket and lower him down. And, you know, that would have had to have been fairly terrifying because they weren't making anything that was closer than a mile to the surface. So imagine being in this rickety metal basket being lowered down there. You're the first guy going down. And when he got there, he said it looked like a, a natural cave, and he got out, walked around a little bit. The, the air quality was horrible. And uh, he had his flashlight going, and he saw something that he thought moved. He went around this little corner in the cave, and he was face-to-face -face with an alien. Uh, what he called an alien, again, like a, a seven-foot gray. And uh, he claims at that point that he pulled his pistol out and ventilated the thing and got the hell out of there. Um, now, later on, he was working, uh, getting back to, to Dulce again, the Archuleta Mesa. They had already built a military base in there, and they were planning on building a second one. And when they were digging the, the boreholes down into the second one, same thing happened. They, they came out into an open space, and uh, backstory on the, the open space is that apparently the government knew all about it. It had been a base that had been constructed a long time previously, and humans and, and aliens were using it. And at some point, the aliens decided that they just wanted to use the whole base and basically kicked the humans out and took it over. Now, the government was well aware of the fact that it was there before they let the crew go ahead and try and, and uh, dig tunnels down into there and build another base there. So what their actual motivation was is uh, is beyond me. But again, they hit, they hit the same problem. There's an open space. What the hell's going on? Phil go down there and check it out. So they put him in a suit, and uh, you know, for protection from environment and whatnot, load him down there in a basket. And uh, this time, he, when he came out, there were supposedly two of these gray aliens there, having already had a previous experience with one. He grabbed the clip, uh, slapped it into his pistol and uh, took some shots at the first one, which he claimed had killed it. They're, they're mortal, they do die, he killed one. The second one had this little box-shaped device on its chest, and it, like, waved its hand over this, and what seemed like uh, some sort of a massical, massive uh, electrical discharge along the lines of a lightning bolt hit him, burned off a bunch of fingers on both of his hands, and opened him up from uh, below the sternum all the way up to the neck, as he as he said in his own words, like a fish. Now, at this point, he was down for the count, but they had already um, started lowering down other people behind him and uh, apparently expecting something. And they had a military contingent that he didn't understand why they were even there. They had shown up a couple days previously. And uh, these guys came down the the, uh, the bore and, and had a huge firefight with these things during the course of which he claimed 66 people were killed, the 44 of which were American service people, uh, uh, special forces, uh, black and green beret, and 22 foreigners also were killed in this firefight. And this was in 1979, and it set off what he claimed was basically a uh, sort of a secret war between us and the aliens that's been ongoing ever since. And uh, so at this point, he decided that people really needed to know about this or you know, uh, the situation was just really out of control. And he still wasn't willing to come forward and talk about it. It was actually his friend, Al Bielek, who kept bugging him over and over and over again to come forward and start getting some of this information out because he wasn't in the Navy anymore or anything. 
And he also had told Al that during the course of this going on that they had visited him a number of times and basically said, why don't you come back to work with us? You shouldn't be talking about this. You caused us a lot of trouble and knock it off. Uh, at which point he said no, and they apparently started trying to assassinate him. Now, at the point where he finally did die, he claimed that they had tried to kill him 13 times already. So um, it kind of makes you wonder what, you know, if his story is true, what exactly they were thinking when the government just let him go ahead and and drill a hole in there. Maybe they were thinking they'd take the aliens by surprise, and that's why they had the military there to go down and wipe out the remainder of them, and they could take over this old base again. But, you know, there's just no way to know. In working with the Black Projects, I was very loyal. I was picked because I was very strong mentally. There's a bunch of us that were picked because we don't crack under pressure. We don't freak under pressure, so to speak. Everyday events don't bother us. Now, I was involved in something very controversial, almost totally unbelievable to most of you. Some of you are religious people. I think all religions, all religions, have a time and a place, and they definitely have a place in America. Now, another thing I want to reach to you is that during the unbelievable part, I was involved in building another base onto in inside of Dulce, New Mexico, which is Los Alamos Laboratory. It's a biological laboratory. On the southwest part of the Archuleta Mesa, uh, we built an underground facility, a better part of three cubic miles hollowed out underground. Then to the southwest of that, we built, we were, we were in the process of the early stages of building. We drilled four large uh, tunnel-like holes. Some of them ran two and a half miles under the surface. Uh, number the early, at that time, number the original uh, uh, wells or dr uh, drilling uh, machines that were used were, were um, uh, at the rate of a, two miles a day. It was fairly rapid. The equipment kept coming up broken, so we wanted to go down. We wanted to send somebody down there, a human observer, or human observers in this case, to find out what was going on. Well, to our total surprise, first of all, the government knew all about it. They didn't tell anybody. Uh, when I saw Green Beret and Black Beret people encamped inside of our geologist camp, I knew something was up. The gig was up. First of all, I knew all about the alien agenda. I'll explain that in a few minutes. The large alien greys had been encamped there for as best as believed possible about four or five hundred years. It had been one of their internal bases. And we'd, we'd drilled holes right on top of it. All the stinking air, all the black sooty air came right out as soon as one of the first hole was sunk and all this soot came up. And Well, that's when it all, all the hell broke loose, really, all it started. Anyway, after we drilled all four holes, it took about a, two days to drill all four of them. And when you build an underground base, you drill four basic holes, and then you build you know, called stopes or cross-member holes across, and then you bla use blasting equipment, you know, special blasting equipment by the analyzation of the rock formation, and you literally blast out or tunnel out or, or deflagrate or melt rock out to build the large rooms that are required for this underground base. Well, in this process, I was lowered down the basket of one of these holes, and about from me to this elderly woman here in the front was sitting a seven-foot-tall alien gray. The stench was worse than the worst garbage can you can imagine. Uh, the person was at, or the entity was absolutely horrible. I didn't waste any time or reach for my pistol. At that time, as an engineer, I didn't have time to carry all the fold or all of one of these big submachine guns that all the sea spray and the yellow fruit and the, all the uh, outer perimeter and inner perimeter security people carried. I carried a little Walter PPK pistol with a nine-shot clip. <clears throat> this was in late August of 1979. Now, you got a regular suit of clothes. You got a regular clothes on. Plus, you're in a almost like a spacesuit environment, 
and you're reaching for a gun, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do and then to pop a clip in it and start shooting. And I killed two of them. Yes, they're mortal and they do die. However, in the process, uh, one of them did this. I rem all I remember is that he just kind of waved his hand in front of his chest and the next thing I know, this blue beam hit me and just literally opened me up like a fish. And every, uh, burnt, burnt my fingers right off of me. And it was some form of electrical force because the kind of like hit, being hit by a lightning bolt burned all my toenails off of me. Uh, completely crispy crittered my left foot. Burnt the shoe right off of me. Um, all I remember is the smoking remains, and I'm laying almost, I'm still conscious, but in and out of, I didn't remember much. And there was a, a Green Beret that was right behind me that risked his life. In fact, he died. But he risked his life. He shoved me back in the bass and hit the button and took me up. And I wouldn't be alive talking to you today if it wasn't for him. I'm forever indebted. He lost his life. 66 Secret Service agents, Green Berets, Black Berets, crack troops lost their lives because the government, our United States government, lied, did not tell us anything about the alien threat. There's a war underneath there, and I'm d talking dead serious. It's been going on since that time. Since late August of 1979, our military, the Russian military, basically the militaries of the world, have been in constant conflict with the outer space alien. The, the small gray, the large gray, the reptilians, the whole thing. There are 11. Yeah, and it's interesting. You, you make you wonder races. why. I know for a lot of people listening to this, they might think this is crazy talk. Uh, but as you and I talked in the past and kind of off the air, uh, I get told this kind of stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Just really weird, strange stories from people kind of like Phil Schneider. They, they're legitimate people telling you this stuff and it's kind of like well, what do you do with it yeah you know and it makes you wonder if it's true it's more terrifying than anything else we got going on Abs if this is absolutely. true absolutely and the other thing is that you know phil if you look into his background he had no history of mental illness or anything along those lines so you can't use the excuse that well he was just you know a crazy guy and that's how he came up with all this because you know he was working for the government in um you know had a very, very high security clearance, and um, if he was a crazy person, they never would have let him work for him in the first place. So, again, this sort of tends to to back up what, what Phil said. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not coming out and saying that I believe all this, that it's absolutely true. No. Me and Wes are presenting this, as much information as we can on these subjects for you guys to think about Go vet that information. Go do some of your own research. Decide what you think about it. We're just going to tell you all the information that we can dig up on these subjects and then let, let you guys make the final decision on what you think. Yeah, I had a guy on one time. Uh, he goes, and this is one of those stories I never put on the air. Uh, it was a law enforcement guy, and he was in New Mexico, and he said he ran into – they were on a um, – like a dirt bike, a mountain biking race or something to that effect. And he said what he saw is this thing cross the road. Well, I'm thinking we're going to talk about Bigfoot. And as he's describing it to me, he said it looked like, he goes, I think it was an alien. And I go, it was what? And and he goes, well, it, it was like a um, half man, half lizard running across the road. It was upright, like how we right. walk but had the face of a snake or face of a lizard. And he said it ran up into the rocks and it was gone. And the other interesting point he said, he said it had a tail. Mm -hmm. And so for the longest time, I was trying to figure out what this guy was talking about because he's not describing a dog man. He's not really describing a Sasquatch and I'm not really big into the alien thing, but this guy was as sincere as they come. And I just could not figure out what this guy was talking about. And he didn't even mm -hmm. know. Uh, and so, you know, as you go into this whole story of, of Dulce and this deep, this dumb, this deep underground military base, I, I, you know, you hear a lot of weird stories. 
I think there was a security guy that got killed there. Have you heard about that? Mm, I'm I'm not sure that I've heard that one. Yeah, it was. Um, I'm trying to remember where I heard it from. Uh, it, the story goes, it was a military guy, and it's eight levels of this underground base. And humans were not allowed to go to like level seven and eight. And in level six, you could hear uh, people screaming for help. And he ended up going down there by mistake. He got stuck on the elevator. He went down there by mistake. Oh, and he said there's, like, people's, people in cages. There's children in cages. And he ended up running into one of uh, – he called it the Dracos, too. He ran into one of the Dracos. Mm -hmm. And he got reprimanded for that. He basically got fired. He got uh, – I don't remember the whole story. He got fired. Something happened with his job. But anyway – he started talking to one of his other friends that were on the base, and they say that the Dracos actually eat people. Um, they get off on – it has to do with the um, adrenal glands. When you become scared, they almost kind of get off on it. And when I heard uh, Phil Snyder talking that exact same thing, it kind of brought chills up my spine because I had heard that before. Um, sometimes I think in life – fact is stranger than fiction and if this is really going on then what what is going on exactly. with this world you know what i mean yeah definitely my personal opinion i i don't think aliens are aliens i i think they're demons but uh that's my own personal opinion i could be 100 percent wrong but I, I firmly believe that it's uh demons demonic activity going on um and it's terrifying man it's terrifying to hear this stuff. It absolutely is. And to see a, see a guy with missing fingers and actually, I think, that, and I'll try and show it in the video, but he actually opens his shirt and it looks like he was flayed open yeah, he, by a, a lightning bolt. Yeah, he did that right in one of the public speeches. They, they've got that on video. Somebody asked him about, you know, can you prove that you had this uh, injury during this firefight with the alien? He unbuttoned his shirt right there and showed him the, the scar from it. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, again, sort of tends to back up everything. Apparently, the, the base... Are you talking about the, the uh, Archuleta Mesa, uh, the base that you're talking about where the guy got fired? I, th I think it was Dulce. Yeah. I want to say it was, was Dulce. Could be it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Supposedly that there's, uh, there's the tall gray aliens and there's the reptoids are the two types that are at this base from what I've been able to understand. I might be wrong. There could be more. Uh, but um, from what I've heard about the uh, the greys yes they do like to predate on humans and they actually make a sort of a drug out of their adrenal gland that they call adrenal chrome that they get high on and uh, which goes right along the lines with the same thing with the uh the reptilians who like to have the uh, humans that they're going to eat, eat um, be extremely terrified before they eat them because apparently they like the, the taste of the meat um, better that way and i can state from from personal experience that I have had meat from a slaughterhouse where they were not very careful about not terrorizing the animals before they delivered the death blow to them. And you could tell the difference. You could taste the difference in the meat. So that's a no BS right there. I can personally bet that there is a difference in the way the meat tastes. And, uh, you know, whether these things get high off it or whatever, there's other people that are on the same page that we are on that think that they are probably demons. And um, they think that these things actually can derive sustenance from negative emotion in some fashion that, uh, you know, fear, um, sadness, uh, heartache, whatever, you know, negative emotions, anger, rage, all these things that they actually can somehow derive um, some sort of sustenance from it. So, I mean, yeah, there's another weird thing that sort of ties in with all of this. Yeah, it does. It uh, it really makes you wonder what's going on up there uh, in this whole thing and what the agenda is. Uh, it's kind of like the insider I had on with Chris. Coincidentally, it was Air Force mm -hmm. that was cracking down on Chris. And Chris was told, don't talk about any sort of DNA manipulation. Don't talk about aliens. Um, stick to Bigfoot and minimize what you say. And, you know, it, it's it's... It's just shocking to me, you know. It, it, I think one day these things are going to pop up, and everyone's reality is going to be shaken to the core. 
Yeah, and, you know, again, that might um, point up to, again, another thing that Chris was talking about, how they're on purpose turning out these movies from Hollywood with, you know, like, again, weird monsters, zombies, vampires, aliens, all this sort of stuff to desensitize people to it so that when this finally comes out, it's not going to be as big of a shock. It won't be this huge culture shock. There won't be people freaking out, you know, hopefully. I don't see how they think that's going to happen, but... um, you know, this is the way it was presented to Chris anyway. Yeah. The other thing too, about Phil, I thought was interesting is Phil always months before his death, he said that if he showed up with a suicide or it showed up looking like a suicide, he let his family know that he didn't, he has no intentions of committing suicide and that he was actually killed. And when he died, they claimed it was a suicide. Mm -hmm. And here's and he didn't live that far from me. He only lived uh, Phil Snyder. He only lived um, he lived in Lake Oswego, which is a twenty thirty minute drive from where I'm at. And his wife had mentioned because in some of these videos that I've been showing throughout this interview, some of these videos he actually will hold up uh, different objects, different elements, different um, pieces of metal. And he'll say this was on this jet, or they've created this metal, they grow it in space, and it with, withholds X amount of uh, degrees of, of fire, you know, or under a flame, it won't burn. Mm-hmm. And she said all that stuff disappeared. Mm-hmm. So here's a guy that commits, quote unquote, commits suicide, and then all of his evidence coincidentally disappears too as well. Yep. Uh, they're really cracking down on uh, whether you and people need to look into this Phil Snyder guy because, like I said, his military record is impeccable. Uh, his service to the country is impeccable. There's no reason for this man to lie. No. None. And I think he actually took a lie detector test, if my memory serves me right, and he passed with flying colors. Yeah, I can I can believe that. You know, if you want to go a little bit more in depth, this might be a good point to um, talk about the situation surrounding his death. He was actually divorced. He was not with his wife at the time, so there wasn't anybody else there in the apartment with him. Supposedly, the only person right. that could have come into the apartment was from somebody from um, elderly disability services that was supposed to have a meeting with him. But apparently, by the time the landlord called and the police showed up to take a look and see if he was okay, he had already been dead for three or four days. And, don't, you know, don't yeah. forget, he had already said that they had had 13 attempts on his life private prior to that, and if he came up dead, it wasn't a suicide. So, now the first police report says death by natural cause. This came out on 117.96. Uh, at 1850 hours, they found him. He was kneeling on the floor next to the bed with his face in the wheelchair. Now, that's kind of a weird position to be in. Um, he appeared to have been dead for three to four days. They tried to call the medical examiner, Mr. Coleman, who, for whatever reason, refused to respond. Therefore, they took his body and sent it to a nearby funeral home. Now, keep in mind, his wife never saw his body, ever. His family didn't see it either. Um, The funeral director then called the police and said, hey, this guy has a piece of medical tubing wrapped around his neck, and it appears that that's how he he died, from strangulation. So... Again, the medical examiner, Mr. Coleman, elected not to respond to this. And also, Police Sergeant Joyce also failed to respond to this. And I went back later and uh, did a little bit of uh, research inquiry on this. And Deputy McClelland, who had actually um, supposedly done the um, investigation, said he did not see anything around Phil's neck at the time while his body was bloated. So if he had a piece of tubing around his neck, he may not have been able to see it just to give the deputy a little leeway. However, um, he did mention that he had seen a piece of an end of a catheter tube near where Phil's neck was, and the deputy also claimed he had not taken any photographs of the scene. Well, when do you not take photographs of a scene of somebody's death um, when you're investigating it? That makes no sense at all. Okay, so they had him at the funeral home. The, they did uh, an autopsy on him. Toxicology came back negative for blood, urine, or stomach contents for drugs. So there was not a death from an overdose. Um, autopsy report said that the death was by asphyxiation. And there's a section of the autopsy report even where it says, 
quote, neck wounds described below. But if you go and look below on the document, there is no description. There's no further entries or description on that document that explains what it was all about. And then later on in the report, it says there was no, no neck wounds and no sign of a struggle. Okay? So Phil's blood and other samples that they had taken then were placed on a three-month hold. After three months elapsed, there were requests to get that material, and they said, well, now it's on a one-year hold. So hoping that people would forget or something. Well, after a year, they came back and requested it again when the year was up. And uh, the answer they got this time was that the samples had been lost. Now, finally, an mm-hmm. obituary on Phil was released to the paper. It was not posted by his family, and it claimed he died of natural causes, even though the official cause of death is, as it currently stands, death by suicide. Yeah. So it makes you wonder if this guy's full of crap and he's lying about everything. A, how does he pass the lie detector test? All the stuff around this story, whether people believe this story or not, and I tend to believe that this story actually happened. Mm -hmm. Because I don't see any reason why he would make this up. Mm-hmm. And it's there's way too much for him to lose. You know, he can lose his military retirement. He can lose his disability. He had way too much to lose over Absolutely. this. Yeah. To come out with this fantastic story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and his retirement at that point was 500000 a year. I mean, this guy's getting a half a million dollars a year. Uh, you know, that, uh, that would be a lot of money to lose just because you want to go out and tell some crazy story. That makes no sense. Yeah, it makes no sense. And then the other interesting part is around his death. Again, whether people believe the story or not. And again, I wasn't there, but I tend to believe this man, what he's saying. Uh, how he died is is odd. Just odd. Very strange. And, he, you know, leading up, leading up to his death, he's saying, hey, listen, if I wind up and they say it's suicide, uh, I let, you know, please know I didn't commit suicide. They've been trying to kill me. I think in one of the videos... And I'll play it for the audience. But in one of the videos, he said he was actually shot in the shoulder, mm-hmm. and he pulled his shirt shirt down, and there's actually a bullet wound in his shoulder. And so I think they were trying to shut this guy up. I think he was saying way too much, and it makes you makes you wonder. It makes it more terrifying to to think, what is the agenda behind this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what's you know what's their reason for being in such a big rush to make sure that he shuts the hell up and and quit spreading this information? If it's false, why bother? Uh, right. Good disinformation. Who cares? You know, it's a great story. Uh, they don't give a shit about people telling lies. They only care when you're telling some real secret that they don't want getting out. And the other thing that, that's interesting here is that he was fairly close to Al Buick and had talked to Al a lot, you know, behind the scenes, and mentioned that he had a whole lot of really interesting paperwork at his apartment. Well, after he died and they spirited his body away, and the uh, next of kin and whatnot came over to collect his effects, there was no paperwork there. That was all gone. Yeah, and that's what I mean. You know, if this guy, if this guy's story is so crazy, and you, then why why go after him? You know, it's such a crazy story. If you didn't have all this other stuff around this story, and he just told this wild, crazy story of this gunfight he had with aliens, people, I think most of the general public would look at it and go, "This guy's insane." Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but when you start looking at the details around the story. Take the whole alien story out for a moment. Just listen to the details around what's going on with this guy. It makes his story more believable, to me anyway. Yeah, it does to me too. Again, you know, the the, uh, the military will not, um, or the government, they won't silence people that are just telling fairy stories. They don't care. The only time that they're interested in getting rid of somebody is when they're telling actual real secrets that they don't want vetted. And, uh, you know, apparently... If you believe what uh, what Phil was saying, that uh, it appears to have been what happened in this situation. Okay. They, back in 1954, I'll give you a quick overview. There was the created 1954 treaty where Eisenhower signed a pact with the known alien species of the time. There were three at the time. And said that we're going to deal in high technology, but you can take a few head of cattle and a few human beings and you can experiment on them. It's unthinkable. It's stuff straight out of the Nazi death camps, and I'm kidding you not, it's plain BS. And it's got to stop. Now, the great in 1954 treaty would have been violated after 
after the great firefight, the alien human war, I am the only living survivor talking about it worldwide at all. The only one. The other two are in nursing homes in Canada, and the Canadian government refuses to allow any U.S. people, including myself, to talk to them because they are afraid of kidnapping. Probably the reason I got shot to pieces and 11 attempts on my life is I am a direct threat to the entire system. The New World Order, the alien agenda is one and the same. It's world takeover and the decimation of the population of this planet. Now I'm going to tell you something a little bit different about the alien species. The bad news ones, there are nine races of alien populations to look at a human being as a bag of food. They're not cannibals. They don't eat the flesh and the bones and all that kind of stuff. They use the glandular secretions of animals and human beings as a mixture of the vitamins for their food. They get high off of our adrenal gland substances called adrenal chrome. It's, a, it's something like uh, cocaine to them. Now, what can we do about it? We can, right now, if we do nothing, we can do nothing about it, and it will continue to go on. Basically, we'll be led in the dark, and you'll keep seeing more and more people disappear. Right now, there's 100,000 children totally unaccountable through FBI archives, cannot be traced anywhere. They haven't been murdered. Nobody's ever seen them. I think they're hauled underneath in some of these bases, and they are summarily done away with, and they are literally eaten. Now, that is a scary thing indeed. Some, and I'm not asking you to believe me in total. I am asking you to seriously do enough homework that you can go out in through the public record, through the congressional records, find out who's voting for what, and go from there. Do your own program. Do your own agenda. And do your own speaking out. And if enough of us do this, there is some saving grace. However, we don't have a whole heap of time left.